About five years ago, right as Google X was being birthed, I sat down with Larry Page, and I was trying to work with him on how we were going to talk about what Google X is. And I was having a hard time getting something concise out of him, so I just started throwing things at him to respond to. So I said, are we a research center? And he said, no. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Are we an incubator? Uh, sort of, not really. Are we just another business unit for Google? Is that what we're going to be? Nope. Good. <laughs> the original vision statement that Kennedy gave to the nation in 1961, that we were going to put a man on the moon and return him safely by the end of the decade, was the original moonshot proposal, at, at least in the moonshot sense. And so I was delighted when, I, after 10 of these things, I threw it to Larry, are we taking moonshots? And he said, yes, that's what we're doing. That made me really happy. So from that afternoon on, what I've been telling the people at Google X is that we're trying to build a moonshot factory. What I mean by that is that we're trying to take moonshots. That word is to remind us that we're trying to work on things that are very hard, that aspire to make the world 10 times better in some way than it currently is, not 10% better, to remind us about the risks that we're taking and the long-term nature of the work that we have ahead of us when we try to do these things. The word factory is meant to remind us that even though we're doing these risky long-term things, that we want to pursue doing them with an eye to actually having the impact that we aspire to, that we're building products and services for the real world. Fast forward five years, I'm tickled, I confess, to see that the word moonshot has made its way fairly heavily now into the popular lexicon. I understand, though I haven't seen the show myself, that the TV show uh, Silicon Valley, the Google, um, in it is called Hooli, and they've now started their own Google X-like organization, which they call XYZ instead. And it's taking moonshots also, and I've personally been upgraded from captain of moonshots to head daydreamer in the TV show, apparently. <laughs> you know, the fact that it's out there is important. And part of the reason that I think that it's important is that there's this bizarre, it's understandable, but it's this frustrating game of not it, that we all play with ourselves. So the small companies say, well, I can't take moonshots. That's for big companies to do because it costs a lot of money to take moonshots. The big companies say, well, we aren't going to take moonshots because that means taking a lot of risk. That's not really our game. That's what the small companies should do because they have nothing to lose. The government say, well, you know, like 50 years ago we were taking moonshots, but that's not really our thing anymore. We have to work on popular immediate problems. We don't have any money. Like, that just can't be us. Sorry. Academics love talking about moonshots. They like writing the papers. They actually produce some of the underlying science that later can turn into a moonshot, but they're not the system builders who are going to build the moonshot themselves. Everyone thinks it's someone else's job, but we're not going to fix the biggest problems in the world if everyone thinks it's someone else's job. The truth is, we can all work on moonshots, working on things that, are, that aspire to be 10 times better rather than 10% better is a mindset. That's what it is. It's got nothing to do specifically with the risk or the money or the time frame. It's a mindset about what we're working towards. And counterintuitive as it is, if you work on things that aspire to be that much better, it not only isn't harder, sometimes it's literally easier. Because when you aspire to make the world that much better, you have to start over. And when you've acknowledged to yourself as a team that you're going to start over, you know that what's going to happen next can't be built on what people have done before. You have to, in a meaningful sense, come at it from a new perspective. And that often, not always, but often unlocks possibilities that make the impossible seem possible. So this is our blueprint for how we take moonshots, for what a moonshot should be in our minds. 
The first thing is that there has to be a huge problem in the world that we want to resolve, that we want to have go away or mitigate in some meaningful way. So for example, 1.2 million people die every year in car accidents. More than a trillion dollars is wasted every year with people sitting in traffic. That is a legitimately world-scale problem. It would be awesome if we could make go away. Number two, there has to be a radical proposal for how to make that problem go away. If it's something that people have tried over and over before in the past, the idea that we or you or anyone else, by just trying harder or staying up later at night, is not really a good outcome. It's not very likely to work. So cars that drive themselves all the way from point A to point B, I think that's like the poster child for a radical sounding proposal to make that kind of problem go away. And then the third one is there has to be some reason to believe, some breakthrough technology, some aha from science or engineering, which makes us believe that even if it's not guaranteed to work, we have a decent shot at learning through the process and maybe, just maybe, getting there. In the case of self-driving cars, that was the DARPA Grand Challenge work that originally happened and some advances in smart software and smart sensors. So each project that fits into this mold then has to describe not just that it fits these things, but that in principle at least, it could produce in the long run a Google scale business or Google scale value to the company in order for us to help it move forward. Our goal is to have each of these things create a ton of value for the world, but then also create back to Google a sort of fair, equitable return on its investment for taking these big risks. And five years in, I'm very happy to say that we've started to make real progress in this space through the graduations that we've done. Some of them play out in different ways. So for example, the massive neural network project that we originally built at Google X, we graduated back into the main part of Google uh, called knowledge, which is what you might think of as search. And in that part of Google, it now is servicing over 50 products and services, helping all these different parts of Google turn signals into symbols more effectively, which is helping Google to be successful. And certainly that's not all our credit because they've done a lot since they left, but we helped to get that going. And that is a good example of the sort of thing that we're shooting for. In a very different way, the smart contact lens work that we built it wasn't going to probably work out optimally for us not only to do the original work on that project, but to take it all the way to the market ourselves. So we developed a partnership with Alcon, the eye care division of Novartis, and now we are headed towards the market through this still very complex process of trying to make contact lenses be able to sense the glucose in your eye to help diabetics manage their, their diabetes better. Um, but that is another example where value can be released through this work, in this case, through a partner. Another of the critical operating principles that we have at Google X is throwing ourselves out into the world to get contact with the real world as fast as possible. It's not sometimes a natural thing to do, but it is an absolutely critical thing to do, especially when you're taking on particularly big, hard projects. You can't possibly know at the beginning the right thing to do, but you can have a process where you discover faster rather than slower that you're on the wrong track. That you can do. So we go through these, these processes for things like the self-driving cars, for our flying wind turbines, for Project Loon, for contact lens uh, work that we do, and for others. We go through this process where uh, we, we force ourselves to seek out this contact. And sometimes this turns out to be us dragging our balloons up to South Dakota to expose the balloons to Arctic winds. Sometimes it's asking a really specific tiny question like how long will this glucose sensor the size of a piece of glitter actually be able to sense glucose while sitting in this tear fluid? The question is how and how fast can you discover that what you're working on is the wrong thing to be working on? And the secret is it's discouraging to hear these things. We all avoid 
going out into the world, throwing ourselves at the world to discover these things. But no matter how discouraging it is now, if you put more time into doing it, you will unconsciously avoid even more doing it tomorrow or a week from now or a month from now. And that's why doing it as fast as you can is actually the easiest time and the most efficient time to discover that you're on the wrong path. And that's why it is sort of central to how Google X works on solving these problems. Now, I want to emphasize, you know, what this basically means is we don't know, and I would go so far as to say nobody really knows the right way to build any of these projects. If you listen to the media stories, you get this sort of nice, tight arc where you know, the, the entrepreneurs that make it were sort of destined to make it, and the ones that didn't were kind of losers who were never going to make it anyway. And it completely misses the point, that feeling in the pit of your stomach where you know where you want to get to, but you really don't know how to get there. I have those feelings all the time. Every single one of our project leads at Google X has those feelings. You're not alone. That's just the truth of the world, that we have those feelings all the time. All we can do is take our best guess about what we should be building, and then don't wait. Get quickly out into the world to discover how wrong you are, which parts are salvageable, and which parts you need to go back to the drawing board about. That's the only way to race forward. So I'm going to tell you about Project Wing as an example of this. When we, oh, Project Wing had some kind of bumpy months, some very bumpy months, in um, late 2013, early 2014. So the goal for Project Wing is self-flying vehicles for delivery. That huge problem with the world that we aspire to, we believe that there are still a significant amount of friction in how physical things are moved around in the physical world. And if you look historically at the Pony Express and the introduction of the post office, at mail order catalogs, which are kind of weirdly the precursor to e-commerce on the internet, if you look at boats, planes, trains, every time people have introduced a way to more efficiently move physical things around in the world, it has utterly and positively changed the world. There's lots of friction left, let's remove some more of it. But that's too hard to work on, that's to get your arms around at the beginning, it's just too much. So we had to pick something to start with. There was a process of brainstorming, and the thing that we got excited about at the beginning was to deliver defibrillators to people. So if somebody is having a heart attack, you've probably seen like an ER show, they say clear, right, and they hit their chest and the guy wakes up again, hopefully. Um, so there is, in this building, I guarantee you like five AEDs, automatic external defibrillators. I bet you not a single person in this room knows where it is, and if somebody fell down on the floor right now, I doubt you anyone would find it in the next five to 10 minutes, sadly. What if defibrillators could come find you, at least get to the front of the building, maybe even get all the way to the person who needed it? So this was our vision. It's small. And it's something where time matters. It's about eight to nine minutes from when someone has a heart attack to when they actually get help today, on average. If we could shave four minutes off of that time, we would save 20,000 lives a year just in the US. So the team got really excited about this. Like, that's a mission. That's a great beachhead mission for this bigger goal. So we started two things in parallel. The engineers, all psyched up because they were going to save all these lives, started building a, a first version of our vehicle, which, by the way, this turns out not to be the right vehicle. Story for another day, but that was another sort of failure mode that we had, and we're now doing a very different vehicle, and that was a painful moment for the engineers. But while they were building the hardware, the software, the sensors for these vehicles, we also immediately had a real-world team that went out to ask, can we kill this project right now, or at least that direction for the project, by finding out that there was something wrong with the plan. We went out and we talked to people, actually had them on dummies use these automatic external defibrillators. We went and we talked to the emergency response people in communities. We literally sat and watched them take phone calls and talked to the person who ran the 911 center in various towns and said, well, could we plug into what you're doing? And we quickly found out the whole plan wasn't going to work. That's good, though. I promise you this was enormously depressing for the team. 
but it was only going to be depressing for them in a much bigger way if we'd let them go for another year and a half till they were all done and then discovered that it was the wrong thing to do. That would have been much more expensive, much more painful. It turned out that it wasn't the right thing to do because, number one, the defibrillators are the, quite hard to use. I mean, in principle, they're not, but most people don't apply them really well. So if you get someone something they don't know how to use really quickly, you actually haven't made the world as better as you were hoping. And the other one is that 911 is just not set up to let us start flying to where the call came from the moment they get the call. In fact, you would be surprised how much they don't even understand where the call comes from. It's a somewhat antiquated system. So it just wasn't a good plan, and this was really depressing for the team. The team took a big step back. Initially, we were trying to figure out what a better beachhead would be. And we came to what I think was the right answer. This is about nine, 10 months ago, where we said, you know what? We're not going to pick a beachhead. Instead, let's just throw ourselves into the world. And we went to Australia, and we started doing deliveries. And we discovered things in that process. We discovered a ton of things in that process. But among other things, we discovered things people wanted delivered that we hadn't even imagined. Cattle ranchers were saying to us, you know what would be awesome is vaccines. We're out in the field, the vaccines have to be stored in a refrigerator, so we never have them with us. They have a really poor shelf life, so we often don't even have them in our barns. But you want it like right there, that's when you need it. If something could just come in the middle of the field and hand me the vaccine, that would be amazing for like the cows that they're taking care of. We would never have figured that out sitting in a conference room on a whiteboard, I promise you. So Project Loon. The goal for Project Loon is to beam internet down to the four billion people in the world who do not currently have a good connection to the digital world. Four billion people. It's sort of hard to imagine something more worth working on than that. And most of these people, surprisingly, by the way, ha already have a device. More than half of them already have a device. It's actually the absence of the connection to the digital world which is stymieing their ability to participate in modern life and to get access to better health, com health outcomes, literacy, the ability to vote, uh, lots of other things. So. When we started, because the idea was to do this from stratospherically based balloons, so this is sort of 60 to 90,000 feet, much up above where the weather is and up above where airplanes fly, we were going to put uh, thousands of these balloons, which you can think of like flying cell towers, and they would talk to each other and they would beam internet down to uh, cell phones or laptops or whatever on the ground. We knew we had a lot to learn because we had not spent, truthfully almost nobody has spent any meaningful time hovering up in that area. But we misestimated how much we had to learn. So one of the things that was a basic part of our plan, it's called the stratosphere because the winds go at different speeds and different directions quite close to each other. It is stratified. And this is a big deal for us, a good deal for us, because we want the balloons to go up and down just a little bit because it doesn't take much energy to cause them to go up and down. And then they can catch winds going in different directions and at different speeds. And so we can teach the balloons, we have taught the balloons to sail on those winds. What we did not fully anticipate once we got up there was if you have winds going like this and winds going like that and your balloon is the size of a house, when it cross crosses that boundary, it gets whipped around. And the violence of that process, every time we went through these layers, was something we really hadn't properly designed into the balloon. And there was a major sort of redesign process to make sure that it was ruggedized to survive those particular kinds of things. Even after that, we were flying balloons, and our goal was to get them to stay up for 100 days. Our modeling of how this could turn into a Google scale business told us that on average, these things needed to last 100 days in order for this to be a viable business. So at first, they would go up, they would explode after five hours and come down, so we could learn pretty quickly that we were on the wrong track. It was kind of a mess, though, because when it came down, you didn't necessarily know why it blew up. Uh, you know, it just sort of pops. Um, and these things are full of helium. But after a while, once we solved those problems, 
our success became an even bigger problem because they would leak really slowly. We would wait a week, we would wait three weeks, then it would start leaking, it would take several more weeks for it to come down in a way where we could get it to come down where we could capture it and then go send someone to like southern Chile to like pick it up. <laughs> This was an incredibly inefficient way to find out that we weren't doing the right thing. We needed to fail faster. We were in the real world, it was giving us these signals, but we needed to accelerate the real world in some way. So we created, in this particular case, something called a leak squad. And their goal was to create, detect, and then fix the leaks that we were having. And they studied a lot of other things in the world where people care about very thin things that don't leak and it's important that they not leak. Doritos bags, sausage casings, condoms. There's a lot of work that's going on in this area. All three of those are important not to leak for somewhat different reasons. <laughs> so, you know, imagine something the size of a house rubbing soap over the et over it and then filling it so full of helium that somewhere the leak would begin and then looking around it for little bubbles. Or having a wand about this big, which is a helium detector, and kind of like a metal detector would go eee if it could like smell the helium. And then waving this thing around this thing the size of a house while you've got it overpressurized with helium, trying to get it to leak so we could find the leak, then we could sort of redesign how the balloon was structured or taking it, as I mentioned before, to South Dakota. There was like this weird polar vortex where Santa Claus weather had come down. It was like minus 40, minus 50 degrees below zero for a couple weeks there. And that was good because that's actually the temperature it is most of the time up in the stratosphere. So most of the stuff did not work, uh, but we did find several really important things. One of my favorite is that in the manufacturing process, the balloons are so big that we, had to, we have to stand on them in order to make them. And so someone brought up the question, I wonder if them walking on the balloons is what's causing some of the leaks. And so we did a test. Everything is an experiment. Failing is fine as long as you set everything up as, a, as an experiment with a hypothesis. So the hypothesis here was, are their feet making little holes? So, the control group was them standing on the balloons the way they were, which is wearing their normal socks. And then we got some really fluffy socks. But we need to control the experiment. So we actually had a line dance, you know, like a kind of can-can line dance. And we had all these manufacturing guys on the balloon doing the line dance in their normal socks. And then we got another balloon, and we had them all put on their big fluffy socks and do the same line dance. And in fact, it turned out that the balloon with the fluffy socks had fewer leaks in it. Uh, and it is literally at that level that we've had to push the real world towards us so we can fail quickly, so we can discover, so we can fix it. Um, I really believe, Loon has made unbelievable progress. In the last, it hasn't even been four years yet, and they've moved from this crazy sounding science project to a viable venture. Our balloons now stay up, by the way, for more than six months at a time, and we can sail them around the world to within 500 yards of where we want them to go routinely. That they've made that progress is because they've been so hungry to fail, because they've been so hungry to get into the real world and to try things. Maybe more than any other project that we have, the self-driving cars have to get into the real world in order to do their learning. It's just the way it's wired. And of course, when we started, we couldn't possibly know the 10,000 things that we would need to do right in order for a car to drive itself really well. Because pretty good most of the time is not good enough when you get into a self-driving car. But we couldn't know what that list was, we're going to sit on some whiteboard and write down the 10,000 weird situations that would happen. So you get out into the real world. And the truth is that the making of that list of those 10,000 things is half of all of what's hard about doing something like this, like making a self-driving car, is figuring out what the real world wants to tell you. So two and a half years ago, this is in the fall of 2012. We were done. We were just done, pretty much. We had this great commute helper. We had it on highways. It was executing beautifully. We were so done 
that we gave a bunch of our Lexus vehicles, like you can see in this picture, to a bunch of Googlers who did not work at Google X. And we said, take this home with you. Use it for your commute. You just drive it to the freeway, you push a button, it'll take care of the rest. Driving on the freeway is actually not that hard. You pretty much stay in your lane, you change lanes occasionally, don't hit the guy in front of you. You know, occasionally some bad driver makes things a little interesting, but basically we had it covered. So we gave it to these people and we made them swear that they were going to pay 100% attention. You know, because when we have our safety drivers in the car, they're like hovering like this over the steering wheel. The car drives for eight hours at a time, and they never touch the steering wheel, but they just have to be like this the whole time. So we were telling these Googlers, you have to do the same thing. We're going to put cameras in the car. This is for your commute, but you got to pay attention. Yeah, oh yeah, totally. We're going to pay so much attention, you can't believe it. <laughs> the cars, thankfully, performed flawlessly. The people did not. <laughs> People don't even pay attention to driving when they're driving. <laughs> you know, they're like makeup and the texting and the burrito. It's horrible. And that's when they're actually supposed to be driving. So imagine what they do when they think the car's mostly got it covered and like once in a blue moon I'm going to need to take over. It was not pretty. It was sufficiently not pretty that we stopped doing it. And we said, okay, this is not going to work. The Humans cannot be a backup system for the computer. Our success was a failure when you factored in human nature. And so we knew that if there was going to be a self-driving car, it was going to have to be something that could go all the way from point A to point B by itself with no help from the person. This was a major existential moment for this team. They thought they were done. And now all of a sudden, they weren't just not done. It wasn't like half step back. They were like, is this even possible? This was two and a half years ago. The first thing was there was like this frantic brainstorming about how we could force people to always pay attention to the road. Because <laughs> then, you know, we'd be like fixed, like training wheels. And it quickly became clear that was not the right way to solve the problem. So after quite a bit of emotional uh, process and soul searching, the team did what I now believe is exactly the right thing. They said, okay, if humans are not a reliable backup system for the computer, let's build a car that doesn't have a steering wheel. Then we won't be tempted to use that as a crutch when we hit these parts of the process where we don't know how to handle. We won't just you know, punt that and be like, oh, well, the people will handle that one. So we did. We've been doing that for two and a half years. And we just announced recently that these cars will start being on uh, city streets uh, in this summer. Super exciting. And <laughs> at first, they're going to have uh, this say, uh, temporary steering wheel in it, and the safety driver will just be sitting there. But that's the right, safe thing to do so that we can make sure that these cars are doing what our bigger cars have been practicing for a long time now, which is to always do the right thing on these city streets, which are much more complicated than being on the highway, going all the way from point A to point B. There's no way we could have learned this sort of thing without spending a ton of time out in the real world. This is also a priceless opportunity for us to start being in these city streets in a more widespread way. And, you know, I think if the Lexus vehicles that we had really eventually were to become the first fully self-driving cars on the streets, it could provoke some anxiety in people. And one of the things that we're hoping is that this car, because it's smaller, it's cuter, um, because it's only going to go 25 miles an hour, uh, because um, we've actually built a foam front end and flexible windshield in here. I hope we never have to use it. But we get to experiment with these things and on a bunch of different fronts, make sure as we're learning that we're keeping the world super, super safe. Um, so I'm excited to see um, this next step for that project. Now, in order for this to really be done, that list of 10,000 things, We've become 
the self-driving car team has become part of its own problem. We are so good at driving now on city streets, we drive 10,000 miles a week in Mountain View. And nothing happens, because the car just does the right thing all the time. It is incredibly boring for the safety drivers. It's not very helpful for the engineers either, because they aren't learning much if the car's just like doo -doo 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 -doo, and then we're like, okay, give it a new address, doo -doo 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 -doo. We need more negative examples. The, the teams at Google X are hungry for these negative examples. So we've created a team on the self-driving car team whose full-time job is to find creative ways to create negative examples under safe conditions for the cars. Now, one of the ways we can do this is just by going to new cities, and we are starting to do this. So for example, coming to San Francisco, there are interesting things like different weather. It's more cloudy here. Maybe you, you would get a little bit more rain. Nah, probably not these days. We're definitely not going to get snow. But as we move from city to city, we can rack up some new experiences. San Francisco, one of the interesting things it'll give us is hills. It's not that the cars are going like, to struggle up the hill. They can go up the hills. But it's a reasonable question, how will the sensors on our cars have a hard time or not when we're tilted like this up a steep San Francisco hill? So that's a good thing for us to learn. But that's still not learning fast enough. So this team has been trying to find more and more ways to challenge the cars. And the ways in which we have to find these rare, weird conditions fall into sort of three different categories. Uh, situation number one is people drive uh, illegally. Situation number two is we just have to react suddenly because people weren't paying attention, and then there's just weird stuff. The um, mail truck sort of jumping out in front of us is sort of the canonic version of this, and we have tried thousands of examples to kind of simulate that sort of jumping out in front of us just to try to stress our cars on our test track. We throw beach balls at it. We've gone to the Halloween store and gotten big birds to swing by the windshield of the car. We've had people hide in canvas bags and pop out in the middle of the road to see what the car would do. On Take Your Children to Work Day, we parked the cars but had the sensors running just so the kids would play around them so we could get the computer used to watching kids move so we could learn how they move. And the reason that we could do the following is because we did all that. A few months ago, we were coming down a suburban side street. The car turned a corner and came automatically to a stop. There was a woman, an, an elderly woman in an electric wheelchair, holding a broom in the middle of the road, trying to shoo a duck out of the middle of the road. And they were going around in little circles in the middle of the road. I'm sure this was shocking to the car as well as to the safety drivers. <laughs> but eventually, she got the duck out of the road, she moved off the street, and the car continued autonomously. That it stopped autonomously and started autonomously again, and there was no problem, is thanks to these field tests that we're doing. Getting out and getting into contact with the real world is the most valuable thing you can do for your project. All of our audacious yearly and quarterly goals have this characteristic of what are we going to build, how are we going to test it in the real world, and how are those tests designed to reveal as fast as possible the unanticipated design flaws with what we're building. I really believe that the progress that Google X has made over the last five years comes from our excitement and throwing ourselves at the world of pursuing these projects with the maniacal focus of a startup and then being hungry to be wrong, being hungry to make mistakes, to get these negative experiences and then harness them to do it better the next time. I know it sounds like a weird thing to be excited about, but I think it's our special sauce. I've always wanted Google X not just to take its own moonshots, but to encourage other people to think this way, to take on some of these problems too. So even if you're not working on a self-driving car, I hope you can take something away from this approach and set yourself up for creative, productive, mistake-filled contact with the real world. Thank you. I'm happy to take a few questions if you like. There are microphones here. So, um, 
Is that working? There yes. we go. Um, so looking at a product that typically development uh, IT organization and balancing innovation from product management and product project management, right? So from a company who's typically focused on building the next product, pounding the sales team lines, building, 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 do you have any suggestions or recommendations of how to actually put engineering culture first on top of that innovation? Is it just a matter of saying, okay, let's put you guys aside, let's insulate you. Is there an insulation process in that inside of the heavily driven product management, sales driven company? I'm not sure this is the answer you, you want. It's a weird thing to say at a developers conference. Uh, I don't think an engineering heavy approach is any better than a sales heavy driven approach. I think any company that is overweighted on any of these things is missing the point. When we look to fail in the real world, we depend equally on finance, on product managers, on designers and UX people, on engineers, Anyone who can find a reason why we're on the wrong track is going to be the superhero of the month for us. And so I guess what I would say is rather than trying to isolate engineering from these pressures, what I would try to do is evangelize to them that they're missing half of their opportunities and that if they think about it as discovering as fast as possible why what we're currently doing isn't the right thing to do, that's the most efficient way to make progress. And cutting off some of the reasons why it might be a bad reason. If you know that it breaks the law of physics and you're not allowed to say so, your, your company is broken and it's wasting its money. And surely like the salespeople are like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and then you can say, well, then invite me to the meetings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just had a question about the self-driving car. Um, I, I think there was a quote from Elon Musk or something. He was saying that sort of it, what you said, right? High, freeway speeds are easy. Zero to 35 range is easy. But it's that 35 to say 55 mile an hour zone where you can't simply stop, right? And, and a lot of you know, crazy things can happen. So I guess I'm just curious to hear, you know, what, what the sort of testing you do in that range is and, you know, uh, what your experiences are. Uh, <clears throat> look, none of it's easy, sure. to be fair. Um, the highways are very constrained situations. There are some oddities that happen, but a microscopic fraction of the oddities that happen on city streets. So. I, that's partly about speed. Part of the issue, which is some of what Elon is getting at there, is that the energy of the car, mv squared, when you double the velocity of the car, you, you get four times the energy, four times the braking distance. It does complicate things when you're going faster. Our experience has been that going slower will help with, from a safety perspective. That's part of why we're focused on 25 miles an hour and under for the moment. But uh, what I would highlight is the really hard bits of this are the duck. Uh, and I, you know, when someone walks out into the street holding a stop sign, like a crossing guard, that's a legal stop sign. But you have to figure, the car has to figure that out. Figuring out the 10,000 things like that, when, the, when a bike is coming the wrong way down a bike lane, which should dominate in the computer's way of approaching that problem? The fact that they should be going that way and, car and bikes tend to be going that way, or the physical reality that its momentum is this way. Just those 10,000 things, my experience, are the really hard things. Yeah. How would you characterize uh, Google X's experience when bringing Google Glass into the real world? Uh, so I've, I've said this before. So first of all, Google Glass, uh, I think, is making really good progress. It's graduated from Google X to Tony Fidel's part of Google. And um, we will be hearing more in the future about that. But I think we did something right and something wrong. The thing that we did right that I would absolutely do again is getting it out into the world. And it's in some ways, even in the way we got it out into the world. The Explorer program was exactly the right thing to do, and we owe a ton to explorers. Thank you if you're one of them. But we were trying to learn also about the social issues around glass, and there were ways in which, by trying to figure out how people would think about glass, we ended up sending signals that it wasn't a prototype, that it was a finished product. Things like putting it on a runway. I mean, even that was not crazy, 
as an experiment to see how people would think about it and respond to it, but it did leave people with the feeling that it was a finished product when we weren't productizing it yet. We were just trying to learn, and I think we left people with some confusing messages there, and that I wish we had done differently. Thank you. How, how do you think about financial resourcing each of these products? Almost by definition, a moonshot, these could have infinite or almost infinite financial resources. So how do you decide which product's going to get a dollar or which one's going to get a billion dollars? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I agree that you need near infinite resources for these things. That's true only if you're too shy to say for long periods of time that you're working on the wrong thing. It's amazing how in every project, when you're doing something dumb, when it's going in the wrong direction, I guarantee you 20% or more of the team knows it within weeks. You guys are engineers, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, and no one will listen to you. What if you lived in a culture where people were like, really? Well, let's stop then. It's, in, it's unbelievable how much money you can save when you do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. <clears throat> but, just to answer the rest of your question, it is also the case that as long as we start on a moonshot and we believe that there's a good return on investment over some very long period of time, where that's a reward risk ratio, is good for Google, then as we go through the process, if you're building this moonshot for us, I'm gonna have a dialogue with you about how much resources have I given you and how much have you de-risked the project. And as long as the risks are coming down faster than I'm giving you money, our ROI is actually getting better. And as long as that's true, I'm just gonna keep handing you the resources. And if we go the other way, where I'm giving you more resources and it's not getting any less risky, then probably the resources shouldn't keep coming. I think I have time for like one or two more. Yes? Uh, so specifically about the self-driving cars, um, could you talk about the 11 accidents that the cars have been involved in over the past year or so, both how they happen and what you've learned from them going forward? So there are certain things that uh, I, I'm not even allowed to get into. There's legal issues around it. Uh, I don't mean at Google, I mean um, the DMV and things like that. But what we've said publicly, and I encourage everyone here, to, if you're interested, to go look at the blog that we post that we put out about this, is seven of those 11, we were parked. I mean, not parked like on the side. We were stationary, so the car wasn't driving. The human wasn't driving either. We were just rear-ended. <laughs> so, you know, like, I don't know what we could do about that. Like, that's just going to keep happening. We should expect that to happen at roughly the rate it's been happening to us, because we can't not have a back end to the car. Um, <laughs> the other four, the person was driving, and we could work, uh, you know, our safety drivers are pretty miraculous, and they have a much better record than me or you guys do, uh, but I'm sure we could improve that in some ways. We have yet to have the car be driving itself when any of these have happened, so I don't have more to report to you on that, but I guess that's good news. Um, but we plan to continue to do these blog posts like we've been doing them to help people understand what we're learning and how we can improve. All right, last question. Um, I had a question about you personally. Right, you, um, you do a lot of projects, you manage a lot of projects, you speak a lot, and like, I've always seen you at your 100%. So what are some things that we, we can do, that you do, uh, to switch context between projects and while remaining efficient? Um, I'm not a maker. I mean, I used to be a maker. I have a PhD in computer science, but to be fair, I'm good at context switching, makers, the people who are actually building the stuff, do not contact switch at the speed that I contact switch. So there's obviously a much longer thing. Maybe I'll do an op-ed on it or something. I think it's an interesting question. But my short answer is, hold yourself to the energy level that you aspire to, but don't necessarily hold yourself to the contact switching level that I do, because that's not always the way to be the most productive. Hey, uh, I'm an engineer at Salesforce, uh, so I was wondering, I always had this attitude where I go to the different departments, I go to the uh, like strange people in the different departments to get some code, uh, to uh, just tell me how they did some things, so I'm not writing this from scratch, and I talk to the people from the bus, like what they think. I have these like strange things and uh, like it's very beneficial. I found this uh, progressing faster. I'm just curious from the people that are around me, I didn't see a lot of such people 
And uh, do you think from your experience it comes like naturally uh, or like you can like teach or motivate someone to do this? Because a lot of people just shy, yeah. they don't I, understand. I understand. I understand the question. I believe everyone here is a moonshot thinker in your hearts. I, I promise you, I would not be giving this talk this way if I did not believe that. I believe that most of us are not in a context where we can be as open-minded, as honest, as dispassionate when appropriate, as authentic as we want to be, as our natural selves would be. And I think you need to ask your context for that opportunity, and if it's really not going to give it to you, be humble, try a few times, and if it doesn't work, go find a new context. You all deserve to be able to let the best part of yourselves out. Thank you very much. <laughs>